And to start off, I'll just give you a brief little introduction to myself. So my name is Eric Gregory. I'm senior technical writer at Mirantis. I'm the author of Learn Kubernetes Five Minutes at a Time, uh, as well as Learn Containers Five Minutes at a Time, and co-host of Radio Cloud Native with Nick Chase, as well as frequently my colleague, John Janschik. Uh, I'm a former computer science instructor, and today I write on Kubernetes, containers, open source, DevOps, and all that kind of goodness. All right, so before we look at the big picture and talk about what WebAssembly is, uh, I want to give you a heads up that a little later on, we're going to do a demo where we're going to build an app uh, using Rust and then compile it to WebAssembly. Uh, and then we're going to turn it into a container image and we're going to run it on Kubernetes. So this is designed to be really easy to follow along with. And if you would like to do so, these are the tools that you'll want to have available. Uh, so two that you might have already. Docker desktop, and then some way to run uh, Kubernetes. I'm going to be doing it using the virtual machine development environment that comes bundled in with Lens if you have a Lens Pro subscription. Uh, but you could just as easily use Minikube or really any distribution. Uh, it's, it's not going to be too particular. Uh, the two pieces that you might need to download depending on what you do, uh, is Rust. And best way to do that is going to be to go to rustlang.org slash tools slash install. And then uh, Wasm Edge, the WebAssembly runtime. And we'll talk about what that actually is and what that means. Uh, you can follow these instructions in the command line here to get going with that. Uh, and that's everything you'll need to do to have that have Wasm Edge running in your current command line session. Uh, or we're going to put in the chat a link that you can follow uh, that gives you basically the same instructions. Um, so I'm telling you this here at the beginning so you can get this set up. And by the time we get to the demo, you'll be ready to go. But from here, I want to back way up and look at things from a much higher level, talk about what WebAssembly is, why you might care, and how it bears on sort of the cloud native context that we live in, especially here at Mirantis. So our big opening question. What is WebAssembly? So you might have heard the quip that the Holy Roman Empire wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire. And you can say something kind of similar about WebAssembly. People often do. From the name, you would think it, it's an assembly language for the web. And that's sort of close to the original conception, but it's off base in some really important particulars. First, WebAssembly isn't limited to the web, as we'll see today. In fact, the first paragraph of the introduction to the core spec tells us WebAssembly, quote, does not make any web-specific assumptions or provide web-specific features, unquote. I'd argue, certainly in our cloud-native corner of the world, that the really exciting possibilities are, are server-side. And second, WebAssembly isn't an assembly language. So if it isn't an assembly language for the web, what is it? WebAssembly is a portable, low-level binary code format built for compactness and efficient code execution. It's widely referred to with the contraction WASM, and some folks prefer that name because it avoids misleading implications. We'll use both names interchangeably here. So at bottom, WASM is a virtual instruction set architecture. You can compare this to a physical ISA like RISC-V or an x86 ISA and get a sense for what kind of stack we're working with here. In the interest of portability, this is more than a traditional assembly language and that it gives us a virtualized architecture and the bytecode format to run code on that architecture. Wasm combines with the WebAssembly system interface standard to interact with operating system services. And with those tools in hand, we just need dedicated compilers for a given language, and we can run the language of our choice in a portable module, including on the web because all of the major browsers support it as a W3C driven standard. So as of 2019, W3C has helped WebAssembly to be on every browser uh, and a reliable standard that you can compile to. And really from a developer standpoint, which is what we're largely gonna to take today, that's exactly what it is. WebAssembly is a standardized virtualized compilation target. In this respect, some of its rough analogs include the Java Virtual Machine. The JVM took a stab at filling a similar role in the 90s, but its proprietary plug-in nature prevented it from taking off as a standard. 
So it had a similar goal, but you know, ultimately now it's kind of a historical artifact. JavaScript itself performs this role very widely today, and its work now extends way above and beyond the original remit. We've got server-side JavaScript and Node.js, of course, and various would-be successors like Dino and Bun looking to make it more efficient. JavaScript isolates are a compelling way to sandbox and modularize code. The ecosystem is really exciting to me, but regardless of how much efficiency you squeeze out of JavaScript, a high-level language is just a definitionally suboptimal compilation target. And of course, you're locked into using JavaScript, on which you know, your mileage may vary. And then third, Linux containers. You probably know if you're here, containers leverage Linux kernel namespaces to create an isolated runtime environment, including all of an application's dependencies, necessary libraries, etc., with the whole bundle ultimately executing to the host kernel. This has proven enormously useful, and it's kickstarted the entire cloud native ecosystem. But there are some drawbacks, which may be more or less relevant to you depending on your use case. And since we're here today talking about running WASM modules on a container orchestrator, this is the comparison that we should drive into, dive into most deeply. So, okay, comparing container images and WASM modules. Well, let's start with the big disadvantage of WASM relative to container images, and that's tooling and developer experience. In the world of containers, we have a massive thriving ecosystem of mature tools, often with a couple of consensus options for any job we need to do. Even if containers can complicate the development loop, as you leverage tools like Kubernetes, they also dramatically streamline many aspects of development and are about as generally beloved as any developer tool out there. Wasm is more of a wild frontier, and that's exciting for a certain type of developer, but there's no doubt that the tool chain is a work in progress with plenty of gaps. The good news for WebAssembly here is that the last six months even have seen some big important steps forward, most notably the direct integration with Docker and the run WASI shim that enables container D to integrate with WebAssembly runtimes. But at the end of the day, using WebAssembly is almost certainly going to involve more greenfield development than other approaches. Container systems do some ingenious things to keep container images relatively lightweight and generally speaking, lighter than virtual machines doing a comparable job. For just a super high level review, container images are broken down into layers. So you'll have your application code up top, direct dependencies underneath, system level libraries and resources below, all the way down until you reach the Linux kernel itself. So say we're running two different Node.js services. Ideally, they'll share the majority of their image layers, layers for Node, maybe Alpine Linux, and so on. Those shared layers won't be duplicated, so you'll save on space relative to a VM system where you're generally going to have a full operating system for each VM. So, okay, as far as footprint goes, so far so good for containers. But we're always trying to get more efficient to optimize our footprint and speed things up. So in container world, we see a lot of work to try and create the most bare bones base images possible with the absolute minimum of cruft or unnecessary components. For one super basic example, you start to ask questions like, do we want curl in this image or is it just taking up space? Do we want a shell in this image or is it just taking up space? By contrast, WebAssembly starts off at an advantage because it's pre-compiled. The module is simply the bytecode for the application which we've compiled from our original high-level language. So going back to the example of a small node microservice, if we want to deploy that as a WebAssembly module, we're going to compile it into bytecode, and that bytecode will execute against a WebAssembly runtime environment, whether that's a client browser or a server-side runtime. And that's it. You're not bundling up the JavaScript code and the node runtime and the runtime's dependencies and any OS accoutrement that you may or may not want. It's just the compiled bytecode. That gives you a much smaller footprint and much quicker time to start. Finally, we should talk about portability. Containers are famously and fundamentally highly portable, but there are some limits. Images have to be tailored to specific machine architectures and operating systems, and that makes sense because they're ultimately using the host system kernel. So if your image is going to run on an ARM machine, like a Raspberry Pi or an AWS Graviton instance, you need an image tailored to that architecture. WebAssembly modules, by contrast, really are platform agnostic. You can compile once and run effectively everywhere. Portability in particular 
drives these quotes from Docker co-creator Solomon Hikes, which you'll see uh, circulated a lot in WebAssembly circles. Uh, so since this is Twitter and he's quoting himself, we, we start down at the bottom. If Wasm plus Wasi existed in 2008, we wouldn't have needed to create Docker. That's how important it is. WebAssembly on the server is the future of computing. A standardized system interface was the missing link. Let's hope Wasi is up to the task. And then he follows. So will Wasm replace Docker? No, but imagine a future where Docker runs Linux containers, window, Windows containers, and Wasm containers side by side. Over time, Wasm might become the most popular container type. Docker will love them all equally and run it all. And indeed, as of late last year, Docker does run WebAssembly modules using the Wasm Edge runtime, which is what we'll be working with today. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about use cases. Given its particular strengths and weaknesses, one of the most natural fits for server-side WebAssembly is edge applications, where resources are limited and high performance is essential. The smaller footprint saves you memory. You're getting the benefits of that faster cold start, and the platform agnosticism means you can be more flexible with hardware and OS. This is the use case we're going to focus on today because it's a situation where pairing Wasm with Kubernetes can make both more effective than they might have been independently. On its own, Wasm gives you a great way to run fast, efficient, portable code, but you need a way to deploy and manage that code at the edge. Kubernetes can be a great solution for orchestrating and managing code at the edge, especially in lightweight distributions like K0s, but container images themselves are often unwieldy for edge environments, especially when speed is of the essence. So this is a particular case where the technologies can be better together. And in a larger sense, you could say the same thing for Wasm and containers themselves. WebAssembly gives you a way to lighten and speed up heavier duty components, while containers give you a richly supported way to develop things that are lighter by nature. And these pieces can play nice with one another through the common abstraction layer of Kubernetes. So just like Solomon Hikes said, we're not talking about a replacement for containers so much as another pouch on our tool belt that helps us tackle problems that used to be a lot more challenging. So, Let's start to drill down into the specific tools and components we're going to use today and how they all work together. On the web, the browser serves as the execution environment for Wasm modules. On the server side, we need a WebAssembly runtime. This is where Wasm Edge comes in. Wasm Edge is a CNCF sandbox project designed to support cloud-native paradigms for WebAssembly usage, especially at the edge, as you would guess from the name. This isn't the only Wasm runtime by any means, or, or even the only one in the CNCF ecosystem, but it's well suited for our use case today. And it's also gotten some good community traction recently being used to bring Wasm functionality to Docker, as we mentioned before. One reason Wasm Edge integrates well with Docker or Kubernetes is that it's open container initiative compliant. Ultimately, this means we can integrate with existing cloud native tooling and treat a Wasm workload very similarly to how we would treat a traditional container using all of those standard OCI abstractions. Now, since this is the cloud native ecosystem, there are quite a few ways that different components can be combined and recombined to do this particular job of orchestrating Wasm workloads with Wasm Edge on Kubernetes. But for practical purposes, there's the easy way and the harder way. All right, the easy way. That is to run Wasm Edge and your Wasm bytecode together bundled inside of a slim container. Now, this has pros and cons. Both of these ways have pros and cons. The pros are that it's very easy while providing significant footprint and performance increase over traditional containers. It'll also work on most clusters without any changes to the underlying substrate. So you can just build and go. The con is that your size and performance, it's, there's gonna be a sacrifice over running Wasm bytecode directly uh, through the container runtime. Now, the harder way is to run Wasm workloads directly via the node's low-level container runtime plus Wasm Edge. So uh, we can use a shim, for example, to have Wasm Edge work together with container D and directly run those Wasm workloads. The pro here is that that's very highly performant and it's optimal for cases where maximum efficiency is critical and it gives you a smaller attack surface. The con is that you have less tooling integration, and the bigger con is that it requires specific cluster configuration, which isn't trivial. So either way, 
either the easy way or the harder way, we're wrapping our WASM code in either a container or a container-like OCI abstraction in order to play nice with Kubernetes. The fundamental difference here lies in where we put the runtime. Either we put it in the container itself, the same way we would bundle V8 with JavaScript code, or we put it deeper down with the container runtime at the node level. You might very reasonably ask, wait, why am I wrapping my WASM workload in a container if part of the appeal is a performance increase over containers? The first answer is to keep using Kubernetes in the first place. So we don't need to totally overhaul our infrastructure, don't need to relearn new systems, but can keep that common abstraction layer with the rich ecosystem of tooling that's built up around it. The second answer is, even putting the runtime directly in a slim container, you can get a really big improvement. The container image size for a really basic microservice can be as little as four megabytes if it's uh, hyper-optimized. Ordinarily, we would view 30 megabytes as like an ultra slim, ultra efficient uh, container and uh, container image size. And more typically, we might expect to see image sizes measured in gigabytes. And out of those four megabytes in the slim container, 80% is the bare bones Linux scaffolding you absolutely need to make the WASM Edge runtime work in that context, which shows you how comparably tiny the runtime itself and the bytecode can be even when bundled. The third answer is security. In the slim container, you have two layers of isolation with the application inside of the highly secure WebAssembly sandbox. This is an improvement over standard containers, though actually a WASM workload running directly will typically be even more secure since it will have a smaller attack surface and issue any potential vulnerabilities associated with the Linux systems in the container. So for the sake of ease and follow along and universality, we're going to do things the very easy way today using WASM Edge inside of a slim container. So we will see how to write a simple Hello World application in Rust, compile it to WebAssembly, create a slim container image, including WASM Edge, and run that container on Kubernetes. Now, I want to say if you're interested in seeing the harder way, learning more about the harder way, or learning about uh, more complicated WebAssembly apps in the future, let us know, um, you know whether in the, the Q&A or any other means. Uh, we'd love to hear about that. And uh, you know that's, that's a topic we could explore in more depth in the future. All right, so for the time being, we're gonna jump into our demo. All right, so our first step is going to be to create the Hello Wasm app. So I'm gonna be giving you the instructions here and I'm going to go out of full screen because I'm gonna be bouncing around a couple of different apps to follow along here. So the first step is to install the Cargo Wasi package with Rust's Cargo Package Manager. This will give us a subcommand to build code targeted to WASM plus WASI. I should note there are other WASM compilers for Rust that we could use, but this one is nice and simple for our purposes. So I've already got that one installed. I'm not gonna worry about that. Now we'll create a new directory for our project. So I'm gonna make mine inside of my tech talks directory here, and I'm gonna call it hello WASM. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, so inside of that directory, I'm going to go ahead and run cargo new hello wasm. All right. So this is gonna give us the bare bones of an app. And if we dig into the source folder and the main.rs file, we'll see that it's pre-populated with a Hello World app. So I'm gonna bring up VS code here. And we can go into the source folder, look at our main.rs file, and it's super simple, right? We've just got this function, we've got our print line. All right, so let's make a tiny little modification to that for fun. We'll say hello wasm, and I'm saving. All right, now we're going to use that wasi subcommand we installed just a moment ago to compile the app to a wasm module. So from our project directory, we're in the right one here. We're going to say cargo. Wazi build. 
And note that we're building this just uh, in, in unoptimized dev style for debugging. Uh, so this isn't going to be our ultra, ultra, highly optimized release build. This is just uh, the quick and dirty way. We're going to be doing things the quick and dirty way uh, all throughout this demo, really. So if we bounce over to the file manager here, we now have a target folder. And if we click through, we're going to see that we have several build files here. We only need this version, hello wasm.wasm. And I'm going to copy this over to a second folder I have going for building the container. All right, so we now have a directory with just the wasm module and this Docker file that we're gonna look at in a minute. So now we wanna build the container, but before we do, let's test the module. So I have the separate directory I just showed you with the Docker file, now the module. So first let's take a look at this Docker file. This is what it looks like. So if you're following along, you'll want to copy this into your own Docker file. And what this is gonna do is build from the base of a slim runtime image from Wasm Edge and add our module. And the container is just going to execute our module when it runs. And we can do the same thing locally. And actually, there's a slight error in this line here. This should be hello wasm.wasm. So here I'm going to do a standard Docker build and push to Docker Hub. So if you're following along, you'll, of course, want to use your own Docker ID here and place it where my name is. Um, so going back. Over here. We're going to run Docker build. We're going to tag it. All right. So we built our container image. Went pretty quickly there. And let's go ahead and push that to Docker Hub. But before we move any further, let's hop over to Docker Desktop and take a look at some container images. So these are the container images stored locally for me. Uh, you can see this is the version of Hello Wasm that I just pushed. Uh, and I'm being bag and bad and not using version tags. So I have this uh, dangling one right here from working on it previously. But note the sizes here, 10 megabytes. And now look at the others, right? Um, we're just in a whole different size classification from the types of images that you're typically working with. Okay, so now we're ready to run our Slim Wasm container on Kubernetes. I have a dev cluster running on Lens already, and uh, we've been doing things quick and dirty so far, so we'll continue that trend and get this pod running imperatively. So we're just gonna run kube control, run hello Wasm, we're pointing at this image. All right, the pod has been created. And then we see it up here, going about its business. And when we open the logs, we've got our Hello Wasm. Now, this container doesn't really have an ongoing task, so the container is going to restart a few times, and then Kubernetes is going to kind of back off restarting. but it's really as simple as that. We've got a very lightweight container running Rust compiled to Wasm. And this particular approach that we've used today is something that we can replicate on virtually any Kubernetes. All right. So throughout this presentation, I've mentioned alternative tool sets a couple of times. And there are a couple pertaining to today's particular use case that I want to briefly highlight so you can explore them if you're interested. The first is Crustlet which takes a different approach to running Wasm workloads in Kubernetes by replacing the, uh, the kubelet with this alternative written in Rust, hence the name. Like Wasm Edge, this is a CNCF sandbox project, and it has its own requirements and limitations, including a good deal of difficulty around networking. For a single developer or very small team working with a small cluster, it's arguably easier to get set up than the Wasm Edge stack. So you might consider it in those sorts of environments and for an application where networking isn't important. But generally the movement is toward Wasm runtimes that integrate at the container runtime level. 
Notably, Azure has moved away from Crestlet in favor of Container D, Run Wasi, and the WebAssembly runtime, which is a more standardized um, sort of way, uh, and it simplifies running containers and Wasm workloads side by side. The second tool I want to mention is Wasm Time, which is another WebAssembly runtime analogous to Wasm Edge. This is actually the one that Azure Kubernetes Service is using as of December 2022. Wasm Time is very widely used and maintained by the Bytecode Alliance, which is a nonprofit group that helped originate the WebAssembly system interface standard and is generally closely involved with WebAssembly happenings of all sorts. Wasm Time can fulfill the same role as Wasm Edge just as happily. In this case, we used Wasm Edge because it's a little more specifically targeted to cloud native use cases and it's under the auspices of the CNCF, but ultimately either is a perfectly solid choice in this context. So, We've seen today that incorporating WebAssembly into your cloud native development can be really quite easy. And even this super simple approach can offer real advantages for edge use cases. But before we go, I also wanna take a step back and think for a moment about the operator point of view, especially for use cases where you might have a lot of edge environments that are or could be managed by Kubernetes and where WebAssembly can solve resource constrained performance criticality problems. With tools like Wasm Edge and Run Wasi, operators really have the ingredients to deploy lightweight Wasm ready Kubernetes clusters to the edge at scale using tools like Cluster API or Mirantis Container Cloud. And that really opens up some powerful and exciting new possibilities for orchestrating workloads at scale across whole new classes of environments while retaining the Kubernetes scaffolding and ecosystem that can help drive a smooth, fast, secure, zero ops sort of approach. Uh, so if you're interested in that operator perspective, again, if you're interested in exploring the harder way, let us know and, and we can try to develop some uh, materials to help out with that. So before we wrap up today, we've got some further reading for those who are interested in uh, diving in a little more. Uh, so there's the Wasm Edge book, uh, which deals with the Wasm Edge runtime, has a lot of great demos. Uh, that's just uh, sort of a free online web format book. Uh, so super useful there. The Wasm Time Guide, which is for the alternative runtime Wasm Time. Uh, it's a, a very similar sort of guide and very useful, highly recommended. And then the print book, The Art of WebAssembly. Uh, the Art of WebAssembly uh, is cool because it uh, takes you a little bit into WebAssembly text, uh, sometimes referred to as WAT, W-A-T. And that's... Uh, as a language to, to compile to the WebAssembly bytecode, it's a good deal lower level, serves as kind of a middle step between the bytecode and the higher level language. Uh, and it helps you to understand what's actually going on in the WASM binary itself. So if you're really interested in WebAssembly and how to optimize it, that's a good place to go. If you're just getting started on your cloud native journey, you can check out my books from Mirantis Press, learn containers five minutes at a time and learn Kubernetes five minutes at a time. Uh, so, you know, if you're a little earlier in the in the path, uh, hopefully those can help you out. And digital copies are available for free at mirantis.com slash press. And I uh, just want to mention our next tech talk, which is going to be on Kyverno, what, why, and how. And that is on February 14th at 4 p.m. Uh, Indian Standard Time, 1030 a.m. GMT or 530 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time. And with that, that's all we've got for today. Thank you so much for joining.